Hi. We're going to be talking about the Brit registry which you are in charge of. I think before we delve into it, because it's, uh, I hear that you're going to do some um, research using the information that's been gathered, and it's all about patient data and all the kind of experiences. But Mish, tell us a little bit more about what 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 is it to start with. So the Brit Registry is a national registry for people who are receiving immunotherapy of some sort. So they're probably under the care of an allergy specialist, either an adult or a child. And the sort of thing that um, um, that we look at are patients who've got uh, being treated for, say, venom allergy, so be in wasp injections, um, or have severe hay fever, so grass pollen, either injections or tablets or drops. And that's the same with things like house dust mite and tree pollen. Uh, we also um, record uh, patients receiving peanut immunotherapy because, of course, that was licensed and available in the UK a couple of years ago. And so th there'll be some many children will have been involved in some of the clinical trials that led to that and ongoing clinical trials in this rapidly developing area. But some will just be re receiving treatment either privately or in the NHS and uh, they can access the, the BRIT registry if they want to. Uh, and we also look at... Um, um, people who are having um, a treatment with uh, a monoclonal antibody, so a very sort of targeted form of immunosuppression for a, a condition called chronic spontaneous urticaria, which is which which looks like an allergy, which is why allergists end up dealing with it, but it's not an allergy at all. It's something completely different. Um, so we're looking at kind of high cost drugs and we're looking at uh, allergen immunotherapy for patients receiving these treatments in the UK. Uh, and the reason why we're doing that is because we know that compared to other parts of Europe, um, the number of people being treated is very small compared to other developed healthcare systems. So it's a, it's a, it's a very big database, a lot of for patient information on there. And it's about their experience, whether the medicines work, whether they don't work, what side of side effects, what how people's experiences. And also, very importantly, it, whether people stay on the medication, because... Uh, very often it's not easy uh, and access to get to a clinic if they need to uh, visit an allergy clinic of course if they uh, are on uh, venom immunotherapy might not be straightforward and easy so I suppose you're, are you learning those experiences you're, you're, you're hearing what people's um, experiences of, of using the medicine as well as how effective they are so we're looking at um, a range of things. Yeah, absolutely. How effective it is, whether it really works or not. And, you know, in practice, that can be very difficult to ascertain. Um, so, um, you know, for, um, for venom allergy, you only really know whether it works if you've been stung whilst you're on treatment. And of course, people who have had serious allergic reactions to venom, bee venom, you know, will avoid those situations. And it has an impact on their quality of life because they have to steer around high risk situations for them. So we look at their quality of life and we see whether that improves during treatment. But we also have a mechanism for recording how things have been if they've been stung. And uh, some of the data that we have already shows that people who are receiving this treatment tend to do very well. It's one of the advantages of, um, of, of having a national registry is these are rare events. And in any one clinic, even if you have like 50 patients on treatment, you're unlikely to have many who get stung in a season. But actually, if we look nationally, you get a feel for what's happening and whether this treatment's effective for people. Uh, so that's one way we're doing it. But you're right, people will have a journey to get this treatment. And it can be quite a journey through the healthcare system in order to access these rare forms of treatment. And um, so we're looking at where people are being treated around the UK. So it gives us an idea of what centres are off, actually physically offering it. A lot of people say, yes, we do, but actually in practice they don't. Um, so these are who are the people who are actually receiving treatment and, and how... Where's it happening? How far do people have to travel in order to access care? Are factors, um, are there other factors that are involved in being able to access care? So, for instance, if you're living in particularly socially deprived parts of the country, do you get the same access to care as if you're not, or you're living in very wealthy parts of the country? Really important stuff. It's about you know equality of access. Um, it's about lowering barriers so that it means that the NHS can do what it says it should do on the tin, which is that everybody has equal access to healthcare. And so with all of the data that you've, you, you have on this registry, how, how do you then scrutinise it? What do you use it? How do you, how do you use it? And then uh, what, what are you uh, when you're looking at the effectiveness, but how are you measuring that? 
So the first thing is that the data that we collect is any, is any data that we have permission to collect and we need patients' permission to do that. So if you're part of the registry, your specialist will have asked you, will have talked to you about the registry, given you some information about what it involves, and you would have had the opportunity to review that, talk to them about it, and sign informed consent to share your data with the registry. Um, so um, it, it's, uh, it's not data that's been collected for no reason at all. It's not a black hole of data, the people who are involved in collecting it are the people who have access to their, their data. So patients have access to their own data. The consultants and the nurses and the doctors who are involved will have access to their own clinic data. So at the touch of a button, they can see they see who's involved in, in who's being treated in their centre, how they're responding to treatment. Uh, they can also see how their centre sh- uh, measures up compared to the rest of the country. So they get a feel for, for what their practice looks like. It benchmarks their practice. Um, and uh, if they want to download their data and do service evaluations or audits to see how they bear up against clinical, you know, national guidelines, they can do that very easily. So it really does improve quality of care, both for the patients and for the centres. We uh, at, at the BSACI, which is the which is the specialist society um, that hold the data for the registry nationally, on behalf of everybody, uh, don't get to see names and of people involved in the uh, patients directly well they ha- they have a, an anonymous number that's associated with their data we can use that national data set to look more widely at trends across the uk um and uh, so that's kind of what we're doing really we're looking at trends we're looking at who's uh, uh, about what sort of treatments are being used we're looking to see how effective those treatments are and also how safe they are as well because there's an opportunity to report side effects and if people stop treatment then sometimes one of the reasons why people stop treatment is because the side effects aren't acceptable and uh, so we try to look to see whether that's happening because of because of side effects and is a uh, have you done any research um yeah, on 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 what, what? So we've so we have looked at various aspects of it, and we're just in the process of um, um, getting further ethical permission to allow us to do more more analysis. And we hope to look. The data has been running. Registry has been running since two thousand and eighteen. So we now have over two thousand uh, participant patient participants in the registry, and we have over sixty centres around the country um, involved in it. So it is really the majority of allergy centres in the UK are now using the registry. Um, and if your centre is not, for instance, then you really ought to be asking them why that's the case. Where will people be able to access that um, research? Um, so we're in the process of um, of uh, doing an analysis of the whole data set. We should have that available by the end of the year. We are going to present it in several formats. So um, we're going to um, try and have the data published in a peer-reviewed scientific journal which provides kind of um, data to the scientific community and to the medical community in the UK which is really important um, and around the world as well which is probably less important to our our participants but it shows you that we can have a an impact that that has wider ripples if you like but we're also going to make sure that the people involved in it get the data as well so they see how things are Uh, are working out and i hope that we'll be able to do something for you in the anaphylaxis in anaphylaxis uk um that will will give some feedback directly to the people who've been involved oh we can definitely do another video on it can't we yeah thank you yeah great i'll be a bit happy with that is is there any other um kind of good directions and use for the for the register or is it purely for that research and to find out the effectiveness and all of the things you've talked about access and uh, so these are kind of uh, these registry databases um there um they will also help us to um be able to i hope plan services and to use it to inform the nhs about where where we ought to be thinking about providing services for people um we can see already that if you're in the devolved nations scotland northern ireland wales your access to a specialist allergy treatment is much less than it would be if you're living in the living in england um and uh uh, you know that's just that's one sort of highlight from it. If you are between sixteen and twenty five, you're much less ac- likely to have access to these treatments than than either if you're younger than that or older than that. So that group, which we call the transition group, a uh, group of uh, people who are moving between children's services and adult services. Um, seem to have less access and we know that that can be associated with worse outcomes for people across the board you know if you have diabetes or epilepsy or um, um, 
kidney disease, for instance, then your outcomes in that age group are much worse than they would be at other times. We know that your risk of having serious anaphylaxis is much worse um, in that age group than at other times of life. And uh, it's probably about access to healthcare, and it's important for us. It gives us the ability to be able to to name and enunciate exactly um, how people are, are not able to access care. Important, very important. Sounds very interesting, Mish. It's a really good piece of work there. Thank you. I hope it's going to be useful for people. We're doing it because we want it to make a difference. I'm sure it will. Lovely to speak to you. Let's talk again, but most definitely when you've got the research published. Great. Thank you. Awesome.